All right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor here in Ottawa. And this show is all about interviewing businesses within the Ottawa region to let people know about Ottawa and what we're all about and how living in Ottawa looks like. And today we are welcomed and delighted to have Dave Wallace here from Creative Dev Ventures. Dave, how are you, buddy? I'm doing excellent. Thank you, Fatty. How are you doing? Doing fantastic, man. So I've met Dave roughly about six months ago or so, and I yeah. feel like I've known this guy for ages. Something about the energy that he brings up and some of the projects that they've been working on are just kind of close to my heart. So I'm going to let Dave kind of speak a little bit about Creative Dev, what you guys are all about. Tell the audience sort of who you are, what you are, and we'll go from there. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thanks. So Creative Dev Ventures, we are basically, we, we do land development. So we've been around for since 2010 pretty much is when we started. And uh, what we do is we try to create properties and environments and communities that are that are going to bring people together, that uh, create a connection, and that will try to fill the void in between pretty much what the stat status quo is of, of what building is and bring into something that's more, that just brings more value to people and mm -hmm. will bring more connection. And that's a big thing of ours with community and, and bringing people together. So Dave, what are some of the uh, projects that you guys worked on recently uh, that are either active or have already been accomplished? Well, so we have a, we have a couple active projects right now. The one that, uh, that we're most proud of right now is a brand new development that we have going on in, in Pembroke. It's a 187 acres. We're planning on building an entire subdivision. The whole goal of the subdivision is, to, is like I said, to bring people together. It's going to be more connection with nature. We're going to have walking paths, uh, connection points, people can get together, adult playland, and, and just things that, that can that the normal neighborhoods don't have. Other than that, we have uh, a couple other projects that are going on right now. We have an apartment building that's that we're in the process of going through right now. We're going through the zoning bylaw and, and we're in our second round of that. We also have another subdivision that we're working on in, in Calabogie. So we've got a lot on the plate and we're really just looking forward to the next year and can't wait to get all these things out. I know, man. It's a busy man. I couldn't even get him on the calendar. It was actually <laughs> like we're trying for about a month and a half to try yeah. just get this date down. So I really <laughs> appreciate that you're uh, giving us the time here. And uh, one of the things that you've mentioned about the projects is that you're always trying to kind of break the status quo. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like what sort of vision do you have for that and how has that been accomplished so far? Well, you know, ever since COVID, there's this thing where there are people are disconnected, right? So we don't have a lot of places where the focus is on community and being together. So one of the things that we try to do is, you know, my, my mentor calls it animation. So we're trying to put features and amenities into all of our designs that, that people can connect, that can get together, you know, maybe put a fire pit and then people can, you know, get together on a fire and mm -hmm. tell stories, put a picnic area or a walking pass where people can walk and connect. Another thing is how we build the communities. Like we want to build them so that they're multi-generational so that you can have grandma and a building that's like just down the street and you can live down and then you can just connect. You can drop your grandma off and then she has a connection. She doesn't feel alone, not by themselves. Right. It's just more of that type of community bringing together and that connection. Is it fair to say that it like it sounds like the communities that you're building are sort of like a small little town by itself kind of thing, but well, kinda. on a smaller scale? Well, well, kind of. It, it is something kind of like that. It's it just more about about not just having house after house after house with no space for the kids to run around or no place where you can talk to your neighbors. Right now, you know, you go in these neighborhoods and, you know, you can have 10 neighbors. Nobody knows any of them. Oh, right? yeah. You oh, know, yeah. That, that cookie cutter that, approach. Yeah. I just, Right? Yeah, you just, all you see is cars come in, cars go out, and that's it. No one talks to each yeah. other. And it would be nice to be able to, to get back to that because, you know, right now people are disconnected and we want to bring them together. It's funny you say that because, for example, my street that I live on, it's a small little sub, you know, community in the suburbs in Canada. And I kid you not, you pick any of the neighbors, yeah. they might know maybe two or three other neighbors on the street. Exactly. Meanwhile, I know every single door all the way to the other end of the street. Right. And I know who they are, what they do, and all of that. But... It's because of the fact that we just, like you said, that we live in a society that's just fast paced. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working nine to five every day. By the time we get back home, there's there's just no there's time, time to do anything. Yeah, It's one of the reasons why I really appreciate open concept layout mm -hmm. because I'll give you an example. I get home and I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there cooking, trying to get things done for the kids. Yeah. And I don't get that connection with them if I didn't have that open concept to just have them yeah. sit there, maybe do their homework, possibly watch TV, whatever it is, but I'm still connecting with them while that's going on. Yeah. And, and can you imagine, like, for example, you're in a, you're in a small subdivision and it's maybe it's a horseshoe shape and in the middle, it's an open area for the kids. So now the kids get to go out, connect with other kids. You can see them because, you know, 
the way it's designed, you can look out, you can see them. Other pe- parents can sit there and go, okay, well, our kids are safe because they're out there playing. Yeah. And, you know, it, yeah, you, you know, you don't have that personal connection, but they're connecting with other people around. They're not just on their, on their phones and, and, you know, finger twitching away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that, the whole village vibe you bring yeah. out, which is really uh, cool. I love the concept. And you said, so you've got one right now in Pembroke, Calabogie, and then that apartment building. Yeah. What's that apartment building look like? Whereabouts in the city is so, it? So we were doing it. So we're doing a 130 uh, unit apartment building. It's going to be on, it's on Montreal Road. Currently, yeah, the design is is more that it's like a, a multi generational type design where we have a mix of of um built like apartment buildings so it's an apartment building but it's got apartments but it also has townhouses built in so oh, wow. there's townhouses that are going on the outside of it and then the inside you can have you'll have your regular and of course we want to create a lot of amenity spaces and these amenity spaces are important because it gives people a chance to get together you know we're going to have a gym you know a space for people to hang Fantastic. out and, yeah. and relax and then you know, uh, maybe a, a place where we can have a, a work area for kids so they can do their homework and just teenagers just hang so they're, they're not in your house all the time you know get them, get them out yeah <laughs> and then that's a thing too like it's a big thing for me is to get them out get them mm-hmm. playing doing things doing activities right. that way they're not necessarily well first off it's uh not really good for their health when they're on their freaking devices all the, all the time, time and yeah. you know they're getting into the, the whole internet and the bullying and all of that nonsense right. if they're out at least they're playing they're getting bre- fresh air i find actually uh there's a study that was done about the amount of fresh air we get nowadays mm-hmm. and it's less than one percent of our time yeah which is ridiculous it's crazy you know when now uh, when we were growing up our parents had to fight to get us in now we got to fight to get them out yeah right so yeah, it's yeah. like it's the complete opposite so that's why when we make our all of our all of our everything that we do now we always have open spaces and we call them play spaces mm-hmm. where you know there's something there that's functional that you can do to keep people occupied fantastic and what got you so turned on to land development and design i mean some people find it boring yeah i find it very interesting I'm just wondering how you got into it. Well, it's funny because so my wife actually started it. So um, she's the CEO. She's a CEO of Creative Dev Ventures, and and uh, so it's Karina. And what she does is she was the one that we were trying to find our way in the whole real estate market. You know, once you start getting into real estate, you're like, what do I do? Do I do flips? Do I do burrs? You know, am I going to build singles, semis? So we wanted to come up with a strategy that was going to set us apart from doing what everyone else was doing. So we came up with land development Mm -hmm. and land development was like a niche at that point. Not a lot of people were doing it. It is. It's also one of the hardest things to do, to be honest with you, because it's like, there is so many steps and I'm sure we're going to talk about it later on to really get there. So that's, I'm I'm good on you. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge. And, and, you know, because there are so many steps, it's kind of daunting, right? And it's not for the faint of heart. Like whenever you think that you've got it, you don't got it. There's always no. a twist. Right? There's always something new. Yeah. There's that nuance of like that particular land, this particular zoning, this yeah. whatever, you, you know, hoops that you have to jump through to just kind of get it the way that you want to get it. Yeah. And and on top of that, it's a, it's the long game. When you're doing land development, it, it's all about the long game. It's not a flip or a bird. It's going to take six months. You're talking, it could take one to two years just to get your approval. And then it could take another year or two to get a shovel in the ground. So it's the long game. So you got to be able to have, you have to have the capital and you have to have the will because if you don't have the will, you're not going to make it through the whole way. You got to have the calluses as well too, (laughs) to do all that work for sure. And I think it's patience. Patience is a massive, massive component of what you guys do. Because again, like you said, it's two to three years before you even get a shovel in the ground, which means probably another another two years before you realize yeah. the fruit of your labor yeah and and then and then the question is how do you carry through that time period mm-hmm. so how, when we started what our our main goal was was to get properties that were close to lrt because they were going to be they were being zoned for intensification but the but we still had to carry the property so what the goal was was buy land that had a property on it already renovate that property either rent it out as a uh, as a just a rental, rent it out by room or Airbnb it, and then that income would carry the property until we had the opportunity to move it to the next stage. That way, we're not out of pocket every month. Mm-hmm. So, that's, so it's really more of like a scotch tape on it for now until yeah. we. Yeah, it's basically like a stopgap. So it helps. It helps keep keep the money flowing, keep the project going. At the same time, you're not going broke because you're paying out bills every month, right? Well, absolutely. And then I think it's the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle in any business is that mm-hmm. finance portion of it, right? Like how yeah. can I bring the business to fruition three, four, five years down the road yeah. and still continue to pay the bills and 
you know, put food on the table yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it becomes tricky because, like you said, it takes one to two years. So you're basically, your money is just sitting there, right? You're, you're paying out, paying out, paying out. And then at the end, then you'll get a lump sum. And then you the same thing next project. You're just sitting there, you're paying out, paying out. And then, boom, you get another big chunk at the end. So you got to be able to weather all that, right? And then, you know, as you know, with the interest rates going up and- and uh, Cost of financing. The cost yep. of financing going through the roof. Well, it's one of the reasons why a lot of the builders, I don't mean to cut you off there, but yeah. a lot of the builders are now kind of putting the brakes on mm -hmm. because of the finance rates, right? Like I've, I've got builders that have got, you know, six, seven, maybe 10 lots that are waiting for them to develop. And I'm not talking like a small little, yeah. you know, I'm talking about like maybe, you know, 100 acres, 200 100 acres, acres, 300 yeah. acres kind of thing. And they're waiting on that because the cost of finance to get these houses in the, you know, in the ground right. is just ridiculous. It is. And, you know, contractors rates have gone up, housing costs have gone up, you know, materials, everything. But, you know, the way that we're, that we're looking at is, you know, the real estate's in cycles, right? So right now we're going through that downturn and, um, uh, I can't remember who actually quoted this to me, but it's like everything's in cycles. And if you wait it out, it's going to happen. So right now, this time will pass. So if you can make it through this thou, rough time. Thou shall pass. Yes, thou shall having pass. You're having a good time, Just, thou yeah, shall pass. Yeah. You're having a bad time, thou shall pass. Yeah. It's a shitty time, thou shall pass. It'll pass. It'll and pass. And it's just the time. And when that time is over, a new time will begin. Time is your fantastic friend. Yeah. Believe it or not, it's <laughs> one of those things where everybody hates time, but everybody loves time. Yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? There's an oxymoron there, but it's it's all because at the end of the day, if you wait it out, like you said, mm -hmm. it's going to pass, regardless yeah. of what it is, yeah. good or bad. Good or bad, 100%. You know, when Robert Kiyosaki was telling everybody, you know, have liquid, you know, be liquid, it's coming. You know, nobody was listening, but it's here, right? And this is the opportunity that people have, if they are liquid, to get a deal, to get in on a project, yeah. because nobody's buying right now. So this is the perfect time. Right. We just secured this this huge property and nobody's buying right now. The market's down. People are willing to negotiate somewhat. Not as you know, they're not willing to make it's deep. It's not cuts, a seller's market but, anymore. It, it's you know, been but, like this, I think, now for a little over a year. It's not yeah. a seller's market. It's more of a buyer's market or liquid market in yeah. in, in that sense for sure. So Especially if, for big pieces of land. Exactly. I got a lot of equity tied in. I'm gonna need to liquidate. I need to do something. So right. what do I do? I might sell it for 80 cents on the dollar just so I can stay liquid and, and do things because a lot of people ended up stretching themselves yeah. as well. Sure. With that being said, you know, you guys, you said you got into this business about 10 years ago. What, what's your background before, if you don't mind me asking, Dave? Well, it's kind of crazy. So actually my background, I got a buried background, buddy. I'm I, I know, and that's one of the reasons why I ask. <laughs> I'd love to entertain the audience with this. Well, yeah, so, so pretty much I actually um, started out, I was in the military for 10 years. So I was a military engineer, two combat engineer regiment. Hua, right? Um, I, I did my uh, I did my time in, in, in Chilliwack and the CP Petawawa, you know, built bridges, blew stuff up, you know, all that stuff. Fun so times, was, buddy. Fun times, you know. And then when I got out of that, I actually came out and we had a lot of skills because a lot of stuff that we did in the engineering corps, we were doing a lot of building, and I, and I was able to because I was in a, I was in a position where I was in a a, a group called resource troop and we did everything. So, you know, we were laying down, we were putting up fences, we were putting down decks, we were putting up walls, we were doing everything. So when I came out, I had all this knowledge and I had all this skill. So when, you know, when my, when I had friends that were fixing up houses and stuff, I would just jump in, you know, I know how to do this. We'll put it up and start going. And then realize that, you know, I'm pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. So I got into it after that. And, and, and I worked for uh, some, some, you know, Fortune 500 companies flying all over the world, you know, doing uh, big stuff. And I realized that that's not where I really wanted to do. Like, you know, as much as it's nice, you know, jet set and all over the place thing and five-star hotels and all that, it gets, after a while, it gets kind of boring. Yep. Been there, right? done it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you start realizing that there's more important things and you want you want yeah. more control of your time. So when, when we started this real estate thing, we realized that, you know what? We actually enjoy this. You know, I, I enjoy... Taking, uh, it's basically like molding clay. I get this, I'll get this apartment or I'll, we'll get a house, we'll just rip it apart and then we can do anything we want. We can make it look any way we want. And that, and that just really propelled us to keep going forward, right? It just brings out that creative portion in you yeah. that you've, you know, you've been longing for, which is, you know, having that background in engineering, like, you know, being yeah. a combat engineer, it's, yeah. it's a massive, 
Everybody thinks, by the way, it's uh, combat engineers. They're just destroying bridges and shit like that. It's not really that. It's not that. But that sometimes is it's building bridges. <laughs> it's building, but yeah. So, it is fun. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but sometimes it is also about building things, securing things, yeah. uh, you know, building that sort of, uh, you know, new threshold to be able to get the army across. Yeah. With that being said, this sounds like you you guys kind of found your calling. Well, yeah. And, and it's like, you know what it's like? It's like. You know, when you uh, you get a kid, you get a blank piece of paper. This is land development's cool. You get a blank piece of paper, you can do anything you want. What are you going to put there? The world is your oyster. This is where we are right now. Yeah. I got this land. What do I want to put there? So then you just start brainstorming ideas and put that. You're basically just throwing stuff out of paper and you go, okay, that was cool. And, and then and then you go talk to an expert and like, you can't do that. I'm like, mm. oh, come on, man. This is my dream, right? And yeah. then you just start molding it and then you get it to exactly what you want. And it's like... Just like when you were, you know, eight years old, 10 years old, playing in the sand, you know, you got your car, you're playing, I'm going to put a mountain here, I'm going to put a road going off there. And it's exactly the same thing. So it's really cool that we're able to kind of get back and just go back to simplicity, simple things down to the lowest denominator and just do what we think is right. And it's really cool. I really like how you're kind of talking about it and like your eyes are just lighting up when you're (laughs) saying it. Tell me about some of the most interesting projects you've ever worked on. Oh, wow. Wow. That's a good one. We've worked on quite a bit. So interesting in the fact that it was a good, bad, a good one or a bad one. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's do one of each. Okay. Let's, let's talk about, um, so, you know, in land development, you always got to do a lot of due diligence, right? So one particular uh, project, uh, just, just outside of the uh, Embraer area, we were, we we're going to purchase this, you know, 10 acre piece of land. It looked amazing. You know, we we're, we're in there, we're going to get a good price, but we wanted to do all of our due diligence. So we wanted to make sure that everything was there that we wanted. So we start getting our studies done, right? We got our geotech that comes back fine. We have power, you know, there's gas, but we don't know if there's any water. So the sellers is obviously pushing us hard. You know, it's coming to the time when there's no the, the point of no return, all right? Conditions have to be taken yep. off. And we're yep. like, we need to figure out what's going on here. It's that time we, we uh, called what? Shit will get off the pot? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something like that. So we need this hydro to come back. So we're talking to the city and, and basically we're coordinating them and it appears that we don't know if there's enough water to support what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So two and days. It's two all days well before, water up in Ember too. It's yeah. all well in that area, right? So two days before the city has a meeting and, and you know, the city's planning on where their water is going to be allocated. Well, it just so happens that we were like 10th on the list and the only the top eight were going to get water. So there was no water available for us for the next three to four years. Jeez. So, Thank God we were pushing this off. We would have been sitting on this property forever. Like yep. two, three years, just money coming out of the bank. We could do no development, no anything. So that yeah, was the bad. Literally <laughs> money in the ground. Oh yeah, it's just throwing it away. Literally. <laughs> yeah. So that was a bad one. Uh, you know, we had a, a real amazing one in, in Calabogi where this was one that we were really happy to get. So we'd always wanted to get a property that was, you know, kind of outside of Ottawa, kind of gives you the cottage feel. And we're like, oh, first of all, we thought it's going to be a cottage. So we buy this property, we go look at it, and we're like, wow, the possibilities here are crazy. So there's a house on it. We look at it, we kind of negotiate, and the same thing. The seller's pushing us to buy it, and we're like, no, 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 no. We got to wait for all our studies, make sure everything's there. Yeah. But, but you know, working through it, like, this property is just beautiful. It's backs onto a golf course. You know, you got 90, you know, 89 acres of beautiful scenes, wetlands. And it turns out that, you know, we, we were able to get this property uh, and we were able to get two, three hundred thousand off the price, which was a hard negotiation as well. And we were able to take this property and we refurbished it and turned it into an Airbnb. So now we Airbnb that property and we're getting generating cash flow from it. And the next step for that is to put a subdivision on that property because we have so much available land. Amazing. How big is that property, if you want me asking? Yeah, it's 89 acres. Wow. In Calabogi, right on the in, golf course. That's in Calabogi, amazing. back on the golf course. And it's really only about an hour away, not it's even. It's pretty much, from, from here, it's it's probably about 50, 50 minutes. I got the way married. you drive, maybe 45. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was coming. I actually got married there. That was back in 07. Really? In Calabogi, like right on the golf course. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, really beautiful. It was a windy day. Yeah. Windy day. With that being said, We've talked about the due diligence process. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more what that entails for you guys. Well, for us, it's pretty much a lot of studies and a lot of research. So when we get a property, we want to make sure that, you know, our, our, what our focus is, is trying to create, make it from a low density into a high density. And that's not always possible, 
right? So you have to look at um, what the city has in their secondary plan, uh, the master plan is for the city. We're looking at if there's any zoning amendments coming up. So we're, you know, so once you get all that done, you're like, okay, is this property available to be zoned? Okay, look at the secondary plan. Okay, maybe it's possible. Is there any amendments coming up? And we make sure that first of all, we're able to upzone this property. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, now we're seeing, are there any services, right? Am I getting water? Which is kind of important. Is there sewer? Do I need to put yeah. a septic in there? Right? Are we we're getting hydro? If there isn't a sewer, oh sorry, if there is no, you know, there's no, basically, you know, can we connect to one? Do we have? To, how much is it going to cost? Right? And then we're looking at in the area. We're okay. What's close to us? Are schools close? Is there, you know, grocery stores close? You know, how far is it from everything? Um, so and if not, is it going to be coming? Yeah, is it going to be yeah. coming? So you have to go through all of these. And then once we kind of get that, okay, okay, now what's the demographics of the area? Can it support this? Right? And then after that, it's all about the studies, right? We'll do our pre-consultation with the city. They'll give us their list of things that has to be done. And we want to make sure that we have a long enough um, close that we can try to make sure that everything that's on that list is covered off by us. So at least that we enough that we can move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty much our due diligence, just making sure all our you know, all our I's are dotted, all our T's are crossed, that nothing is gonna pop up at the last minute. Yeah. And and I love using way. that particular clause on an agreement to purchase because yeah. it basically covers you as the buyer mm -hmm. from almost every angle. Right. right? It's uh, being able to kind of take care of everything that's gonna come up or me to successfully purchase that property and then not worry about the fact that I just lost a couple of millions, maybe more. Pretty much, right? Yeah. You know, and the, when you look at it, the hardest part is making the decision to buy it. Everything else doesn't matter until you make that decision. Everything else is work. Right? Right? So, and you, up until that point, it's all pie in the sky. But once you purchase it, now it's real. Now you got to get to work. Yeah. That's where the real work really starts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long normally do you guys prefer to have the due diligence process? So it would be nice to have it for six months, six to 12 months would be nice. But right now it's really hard. Most people are like three, four months and it's, and it's, it's tight. Three, four months is tight. You like really to tight. Yeah. Out. So like even I've, I've done a few commercial properties in the past couple of months and it's, it's really tight, even at 90 days Yeah. to, uh, to get a study, for example, an environmental <coughs> or to get some sort of a, you know, the city looking at it or inspections, mm -hmm. whatever. And then the other thing is like, you know, these things, they not just take time, but there's only certain people that can do it in the city. Yeah. It's not a lot of people that can do environmental studies and things like that. So you're really at the mercy of scheduling as well, too. So that's yeah. another thing. And, and that's for sure. Uh, but it never hurts to, you know, be in the process and push for an extension on that if you have to. Exactly. The chances are often more than not the seller is willing to give you a little bit of an extension. It's not always. Not always. Yeah. It just depends on how aggressive they are yeah. trying to sell it. Well, typically. And who else is on the yeah. plate? Well, typically by the time they're ready to sell, they want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So if you want an extension, it's going to cost you. Yeah. And this is, this is what we've, man, it's been the last four in a row. Every time you go back to the seller to get an extension, they're like, they put some money down. Let me know you're serious. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of that, you know, sometimes their asking price is kind of steep and it depends who their lawyer is, who their realtor is, how aggressive they are. But typically, yes, you can get it, but the but their extension time is not going to be as long as you want. So you're still going to get a little bit of bump, but not everything you want. Yeah. So it's better to negotiate that in the beginning. Give yourself the flexibility 100%. to have all that extra time than have to be begging, 100%. To, begging for a little bit, a little bit of crumbs yeah. every now and then. Yeah. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, we do quite a lot as salespeople is like, oh, we'll just, we'll make the mistake and ask for forgiveness later. Yeah. It doesn't work that way when it comes to stuff like this, because I think you're really, what you're doing is you're putting a bad taste in the seller's mouth yeah. and they're not willing to, you know, to, some of them are not willing to negotiate. It's yeah. like, well, why do you keep coming back to me Pretty and much. trying to push the date? Pretty much. Uh, because again, it's it's emotional for them too, right? right? Like they're getting rid of this piece of land or this property that they've had and it took a toll on them to actually come out and sell it. Yeah. And a lot of them had these properties in their family, like was passed down from their dad, mm -hmm. right? From their mom. So they're like, you know, I'm selling this to you and, you know, they have that connection. And then yeah. like, it's almost an offense. It used to be our hunting camp yeah. or it used to be this. Yeah. And, yeah especially for Calabogi, for example. Yeah. Like you'd be, there's a lot riding on it yeah so it makes sense to just really like i said ask for the forgiveness don't ask for the forgiveness later yeah. actually work on it from the beginning, it the beginning. get it done right mm -hmm. push for an extension 
before. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the times, for example, I get buyers that are like, oh yeah, I just want to put in like a five day condition, this oh. and that. I said, no, no, no. Let's ask for 10. If they give us seven, yeah. we're good. Yeah. You know what I mean? This way, at least we know that we have a little couple of extra days that we can play around with. Yeah. Even if you're prepared, still ask for that additional time if you can. And hey, if you end up cutting it in half, why not? Yeah. And those you, extra days are are gold. Yeah. Because, you know, we've we've literally had had deals that were like the day before and or the day of we're closing. That's how close it was. Yeah. And so any extra time you can get. So the whole goal is to get a long close. Push it out as far as you can. The ultimate goal would be to push it out even further so that you have all your approvals, everything done by the time that you're ready to yeah. close. Because again, like you said earlier, it's basically putting the money in the ground and yeah. you're just, you're financing the rest of it or yeah. whatever, the, you know, the, the due diligence state and all of that. Well, why not just push the close to later? And then this way, when the close happened, you're already starting to dig and doing all of that stuff. Exactly. You know, and, and if we can get to that every time, that'd be great. But that's a tough sell for most people. So what's the plan for you guys for the uh, the Pembroke and the Calabogie projects? Well, for the Pembroke project, uh, right now we're, we're on phase one. It's going to be a three-phase project. Phase one is, is about 30 acres. And the plan is to put in about 300 to 400 units. So they're going to be mixed use. We're going to have some singles, some multis, and some some low rise. And that, that gives us, that goes back to our multi-generational where you can yeah. have the different build forms, different build types. Um, in that area, we're going to be putting walking paths, picnic areas. Uh, we call it adult playland. You know, it's just a spot where you can just, you know, play games, uh, you know, maybe put a, a chessboard on a picnic table, mm -hmm. just stuff like that. And then that's going to be for for phase one. And then, as, and then that gives us another 150 acres to work with afterwards. So uh, as phase one matures more, we, we're developing the master plan for phase two and three at the same time. So we have an idea what we want to do, but we're waiting to see how phase one goes and to implement into phase two. So what's the, the goal is we're going to be having this master plan made up. We'll get phase one. We're going to set the layout of how we want it to look and feel. And then at that point, we're, eat, we're going to open it up to some builders to just some, buy some lots and we're going to build some of them ourselves. So we always try to keep something in our portfolio yeah. that we have little pieces everywhere. So would that be like the phase one that you're doing it yourself and so, then phase two, three, having some builders come in? Or? Yeah, I think we're going to get builders to come in for phase one. Phase three is going to be our baby. That's going to be all us. That's everything. We've already started to plan out yeah. what we want to do there. And then phase two is going to be more of a collaboration between us. And it makes sense too, because I mean, we all know like no, no builder wants to build unless they have at least half their money in. Yeah, you know, selling some of the, those units out, and, and yeah. you know, being able to kind of just at least have some some lump sum that they can start building and putting, you know, more concrete yeah. in the ground and what yeah. have you. And, and they want blocks of land. They don't just want one or two. These guys want blocks, and it gives them an ability to put, you know, spread their pricing out, figure out how they want to do it. At the same time, not saturate the market with too much product. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, building fifty houses in a, at a time is like it's, it doesn't work because the demand's not there. You know. This, uh, as we have the scarcity mentality, right? When it's scarce, you know, it's, okay, now it's desired. So everybody wants to get yeah. there. So we want to build a couple at a time. Well, the cool thing too, like even though the market did take a, a bit of a dip and a hit or whatever you want to call it, it's still very much a builder's market yeah. in, in one way or another, because we still have a very, very massive shortage of su supply here yeah. in the Ottawa region yeah. and mostly Ontario. With that being said, I just want to kind of go back to some of the points that you've mentioned with all those builders coming in. How do you guys vet your builders and what makes a good builder and a bad builder? And how do you plan on kind of building that relationship? Wow. So so right now we are literally interviewing builders. Um, like I, I've traveled. I, I'm a road warrior right now. I'm going back and forth to, Pe uh, to, to, <laughs> to Pembroke like two, three times a week. And we are interviewing these builders, seeing what what they're doing now. Um, talking to them, seeing what their outlook is, what their goal, oh, what their be vision a fly is. Fly on the wall in one and, of those meetings, man. And you know, and and, and what we're 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 not just looking for someone to just come up, throw some walls up and start slapping things together. We're trying to find people that have our vision, that, that they're looking at things holistically like we're looking at it mm -hmm. and saying, I want this type of environment. Because the one thing that we don't want is we don't want to do what everyone else is doing and just, just slap houses. No so, cookie cutter, but Haven home. Or no, home. no, we're not looking to do that. So <laughs> the interview process Those are has like been really the bane good. of my existence, by the way. Like I take, <laughs> I take clients and I'm looking at it and I'm going, man, I can literally jump between this roof and that roof. <laughs> Without even stretching. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's like, that's a, to me, that's not really a good way to live because yeah. like you, there's no space. There's no, 
land. There's no that sense of like, and again, it goes back to the whole, like I just get in my house and I close the doors and that's it. Like yeah. that's my, that's yeah. all I own. And then the other thing is also is the, you know, we don't, we want to give people like, you want to have some green space so you can be grounded, right? You want to have something. You can go my, I can go in my backyard. My backyard's not 10 feet from my step to my fence. Yeah. Right. So you want, you want to have lots that are big enough that people can actually put a nice house. Um, you know, they have some room for the kids to play in the back. You can, you know, hang out in the front, cut your grass, you know? So that is pretty cool. But the key to that is having the right builders and, and the interview process has been, it's been super cool. You know, you get to talk to all these guys, you know, we're talking to, you know, the old dogs that have been doing it for 30 years. And we're talking to the young guys that are 25, trying to get into building and see the excitement. And, and, you know, we just trying to find the best fit for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, and that's part of it. And and once we get that vision, we're just going to hang on to those guys. Say, All right, we're going to we're going to ride with these guys. Well, that's the thing. You build a portfolio of uh, services and, and people that are just mm -hmm. kind of along the same vision as you. Mm -hmm. And that kind of how you, you know, go about the next project and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. With that being said, you've been doing the interview process for quite some time. Yeah. What have you learned? I've learned a lot. Like literally, it's it's amazing when you're going through this process and you, we tell them what we want to do and then we just listen and they're just like, wow, you really want to do that? And we're like, yeah. So like the minute we start talking about community and connection, literally these guys just, they, they basically sit down and go, wow, that's what I've been waiting for. And they're like, this is, I know I want to be a part of this. And then they start telling us more about the local economy. Uh, they start uh, letting us know what the housing market is, what the best building time would be. They're literally just giving us everything and it's great. So we're basically just compiling all this information from all these different sources and we're trying to come up with the perfect mix and the perfect match yep. to get them all together. And that's why I was saying super I'd, cool. I'd love to be a fly on the wall <laughs> in one of those meetings for yeah. sure. So building has been something kind of like, you know, near and dear to my heart. My, yeah. I know I've told you this before, my dad is an architect. He's yeah. been an architect for pretty much as long as I've been alive. Um, with that sort of in mind, to me, it's always about, you know, putting something of value or putting sort of like your touch on it. Yeah. What do you feel for you guys, you and Karina, what sort of touch that you're going to put on this project? I think what we're going to, our touch is going to be connection spot where people can get together. They can hang out. I'm going to call it Dave's Corner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a big one. Every time we do any project, they're all like, um, what are you going to call it? She's going to say, I'm going to call it Wallace Lane. She can, Karina's like, you're always calling it by your name. And I'm like, <laughs> so. <laughs> Karina uh, Lane. Karina Lane, you know. Um, is, but uh, yeah, we want to just put like, like I would love to have like an open pit area where you can have campfires. People can just like at nighttime get together, roast some marshmallows, you know, uh, uh, picnic area and walking paths. Walking paths are going to be super cool. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful thing about this property is there's a wet, the wetlands has has some turtles in it, it has birds. So we create this environment where you can just have spots to sit. We'll put benches and you can walk through, sit down, listen to the birds, yep. watch animals go through. It's just serenity, right? And, you're, and now you get a chance to just decompress from all of what's going on, right? So it's pretty cool. Exactly. The one thing that I wanted to actually ask you about the uh, the whole wetlands, because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what it's like to purchase a piece of land like mm -hmm. this that has some sort of environmental ramifications if you right. don't do it properly. right? What are some of the ways that you guys are taking and some of the measures that you're taking to ensure that these wetlands are protected and preserved and used yeah, in well, a good way? Well, first of all, you know, you're pretty much a regulator that you have to have a buffer zone around. So we try to design in a way that we're far enough away from the buffer zone that we don't disturb what's going on in the wetlands. And we kind of put that into our design, whereas there's going to be a separation even before the buffer zones that, and that we don't, so that that residents can still have it, their backyard, and that then they'll see the wetlands. And then from there, creating paths to get into it and around it so that people aren't trudging through it. We don't want to disturb what's going on in mm -hmm. there, but we want people to, to enjoy and to see it. So a lot of the, another thing that we do is we try to create a natural, uh, we try to keep the natural barrier around it as much as possible. So we keep as many trees as we can. If we have to, we put some greenery up just to try to protect it and make sure that it's not, you know, that we're no one is disturbing it too much and then from there then it's into the imagination what i want to put here do yeah. i want to put a gazebo on a hill where people can come and and have a picnic and family can get together and just go explore nature young young right? kids maybe they're right? make out spot you never know well hey, hey, hey. <laughs> i don't know what you're doing out there buddy but <laughs> you know <laughs> hey you, you gotta be looking out for the next generation come on I got you. I got you. But that, that you know, it's just stuff like that. And and you just, you just imagine, just like imagine, you know, you're you're living in this community. You walk there, and there's a picnic spot. You sit there, you have a picnic with your family, and you just enjoy. And that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Yeah, amazing, man, Dave. 
Honestly, man, it's been a pleasure. Really, really appreciate you coming on the show. As I mentioned to the audience earlier, I've only known you for about six months or so. I've known Karina for longer. Yeah. Having said that, every time I'm meeting with you or I'm talking to you, I feel like there's so much energy between us. There's so okay. much to talk about. Yeah. And I'm always learning something new. Okay. Always. With that being said, I think we might have to do a part two at some point once the project is ready and, oh, yeah, and, and done and just kind of let people know about, you know, what's the next step, what's coming up for Dave and Karina, yeah. what are we going to look for creative dev? Yeah, maybe you know? do a site visit, come, come check it Absolutely. out. Absolutely, I'd love to do that actually yeah. once when maybe the winter kind of uh, yeah. surpasses. Well, you don't, you don't like walking in snow or what's going on, man? I'll bring my snowshoes for <laughs> bring sure. Your snowshoes. We can go try. Yeah, I got a right couple. You, you want me to bring mine too? Yeah, man. Yeah. Let's go. Let's do Amazing. It. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate it. And guys, thank you so much again for tuning in uh, to another episode here at Canada on the Rocks. Love to can I get you guys to hit the like button or subscribe so you can get more of these interviews and know a little bit more about the Ottawa area and what we do. This channel is all about Ottawa and what we do and the businesses around Ottawa and how we can serve the community. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.